Good morning. Welcome to worship today. A special welcome to those who are joining us from their own homes or wherever they may be. We continue to worship our Savior and know that He lives. And because He lives, we too shall live. And that's what this whole Easter season is about. That's what our series is about. Our Redeemer lives. And today we see that because He lives, He restores our hope. In times that are uncertain, we may doubt, but we have hope. In times when we don't know where to turn, well, we have the answer. We've always had the answer. God has given it to us. And whenever we're, we're drifting away or, or losing that hope, well, he has a way of bringing us back in, reminding us that he is our good God, our wonderful Lord who always takes care of us through thick and through thin. So we worship our Lord. 
the same Lord who gives us this wonderful hope. We begin with our opening hymn, To Your Temple I Draw Near. stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes from Acts chapter 24. Here we look at the Apostle Paul. He's going to be on trial here. He's going to be accused of believing in Jesus who rose from the dead. What a terrible thing. Of course, there are many other false accusations against him as well. But he holds to the ancient hope of Scripture, the resurrection of the dead. And so he uses this opportunity in a wonderful way to preach the gospel. This lesson will also serve as a basis for our sermon. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no, one, that, that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men. That, they will be resur that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or those who are here should state what crime they have found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was the one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with our psalm of the day, Psalm 67. Gracious and merciful God, fill our hearts with joy and confidence. 
that with all boldness we may proclaim the story of your salvation among all the people of the earth to the praise of your great name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our second lesson this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 1. For the next several weeks, we'll continue looking at 1 Peter. He, we used a lesson from that for our sermon last week and looked at how he's writing in a time when people were being persecuted. But here he, he gives us a wonderful reminder that we have hope and it's restored to us through Christ. That's where it comes from. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your life as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to please stand for the verse of the day. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Our hearts were burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Alleluia. Our Holy Gospel this morning comes from Luke chapter 24. This lesson actually takes place before the lesson we had last week of, of doubting Thomas. Jesus rose victoriously and triumphantly from the grave. And, and as he's going about, he'll meet two people on the road. And, and they'll soon learn that he is the Savior. And, and it comes about in such a neat way. Listen to our Gospel from Luke. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb only this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to come, have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. 
Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated and we continue with the hymn of the day, hymn 160, this joyful Easter tide. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia. You know, it doesn't take a, a person who's been a Christian very long to, to learn a, a wonderful fact about our God. His timing is always perfect. His timing is always always just right. We know that whatever works out the, the way that it happens, it's going to be the way that God planned it. Maybe during whatever situation it is that we're facing, we might not see how it's going to line up. We might not be able to, to connect all the dots, don't see how it's all going to fit together in the end, but we know that it will. In the moment, it might look as if nothing could be good. Nothing wonderful could happen from this. It's only despair and doubt and, and doom. But we know that God will make it good somehow. God's timing is, is perfect timing, and, and that's what gives us hope. 
That's what gives us peace and, and comfort instead of doubts. A number of months ago, I, I planned out worship about to this point. I had no idea what would be happening in the world right now, but, but now for two weeks in a row, the lessons seem to fit perfectly with what we're facing. I didn't know what the world would look like. I didn't know that the lesson I would pick would be about uh, a man named Paul who was going to be facing restrictions and limitations just like we were. I knew it would be the third Sunday of Easter. I knew I'd be preaching on Paul. I knew I was going to tell you and, and everyone else that, that he had this wonderful opportunity to share the gospel. But I didn't realize that his situation, albeit more restricted and more limited than ours, that it would fit with us. And I hate to beat a horse to death and, and talk about this all the time, but it's on our minds. And God gives us his word to, to give us hope in the darkest of situations, in the most uncertain of times. And, and that's what we have here yet again. And what we're going to learn today is that, that God's timing, always perfect, giving us hope, hope based on Jesus who rose from the dead. That's what Paul's going to say. Paul's on trial. The governor, Felix, calls him in, and, and he has to make his case before people who are throwing all sorts of accusations against him. And most of them are false. Most of them aren't true. They just want this guy who believes in Jesus, who believes in the prophets and the scriptures, to be gone. And so you'd think he'd cower, he'd, he'd give in and give up, but we don't see that. Instead, he looks at the situation and says, could there be a better time to witness my faith? Could there be a better time to preach the gospel? And he goes on and he says, I believe these things and I have the same hope that these men before me had. What we'll see today is, is we have the same hope too. We have the same scriptures. We have the same Jesus who died and rose. What a wonderful thing that is. And so we're going to learn how we can have hope, how we can have the same hope of those before us, all because of what Jesus has done. What a wonderful thing. Let's listen again to that hope that we have, turning to our first lesson from Acts 24. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that you are a number, for a number of years, you have been a judge over this nation. So I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no one, no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. No accusers uh, found me arguing with them at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogue or anywhere else, and they cannot prove that I've done anything wrong. They have no charges against me. So, so Paul starts making his defense uh, in, a, in a respectable way. He, he knows the governor. He's, he's a, a Roman citizen. He, he knows his rights. He knows he can have a defense. He, he goes about it and says, I respectfully understand the situation. I will make this defense for you. But there is no proof of anything that they're saying against me. Because most of the things they were throwing at him were, were insults or made up accusations that couldn't hold weight because no one had proof. So there's that part, but he doesn't focus on that part. Instead, he's going to focus on something far more important than just who's right and who's wrong, if, if they have a valid reason for him to be in court or not. So he goes on, starting at verse 14. He says, However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. God has perfect timing. Sometimes that timing does not line up with the way that we want to do things. Paul was a missionary. Paul, before he was, he was called Saul, and he was one of those who would have known what the prophets and the law had said, probably better than most. He studied under Gamaliel. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. If there was anybody who could say that they, they knew what the Old Testament said, it would have been the Apostle Paul. See, when he was Saul, he persecuted the church. 
He was going after those who followed Christ. He knew nothing about what this Old Testament scripture meant pointing ahead to Jesus. He didn't think he was the one. And so God himself, Jesus, appeared to him, asked, why are you persecuting me? And he'd use one of the most ferocious persecutors of the church, flip it all around, and make him one of the fiercest missionaries in all the world. He would go on and he'd, he'd write, of course, carried along by the Holy Spirit, most of the New Testament that we have today. God used Paul in this wonderful situation. He used him. He made the most uh, of the opportunity that was in front of him. And what Paul was to do was to go around preaching and teaching, going from place to place, planting churches, telling them about the truth of their Savior, that he really died. He really rose, and, and their sins are truly forgiven. That's what he was doing. So one would think that now all of that would have stopped. One would think that someone who is in chains in prison and now on trial wouldn't have any opportunity to do his ministry that way anymore. It would be different. There would seem as if there is going to be nobody out there who he could convert. But God doesn't have the words restricted or limited in his vocabulary. What God wants to accomplish, he will accomplish, and there's nothing that can get in his way. Well, there might be some obstacles for us. Well, God provides opportunities for us to, to do things differently and reach people in ways we've never reached them before. And that's what Paul does. He doesn't, he doesn't give up. No, he steps up to this occasion and he tells them, I admit to these things, not to the false accusations, but I admit these things. I admit that I worship the God of our fathers. I admit that I'm a follower of the way. I admit that I believe everything in the law and the prophets. This was a death sentence. If he admitted these things, which he did admit, things weren't going to go well for him. They would have said, see, he, he, he does what, he, what we said he was doing. But that doesn't scare him. He uses this opportunity. He knows God's timing is perfect and, and that nothing else can give hope besides relying on God's word. So he says, it's true. I am a follower. I do believe. And, and he talks about this, this, this neat way that they used to talk about the church. He says, I'm a follower of the way. The way was the way early Christians described being brought and led by the Holy Spirit on the path that leads to heaven. When the Holy Spirit con converted them, or, or you or anybody else, he takes them from one way and leads them to the right way. That way is the way of hope. That hope is through Jesus our Savior, who truly died and rose. So they said they, they know the way. They call themselves the way. Those who were opposed to this, opposed to who Jesus was, what he had done in the resurrection, because it was so divisive among the people, they called this a sect. But Paul's like, this, this isn't the sect. You guys are the ones who are straying from the word. So he reminds them, I do worship God. I do follow the way. You call us a sect, but I believe everything that agrees with the law and that it's written in the prophets. Everything that you guys say you believe, I believe. And all of this is going to point ahead to something beautiful and wonderful. Paul made the most of this opportunity. And if we're thinking that Paul was, was mistaken, he didn't know what he was talking about, remember that unique education that he had. He knew the law. He knew the prophets. He knew what this way was all about. Jesus himself had come to him and had changed him from a path that was going down the wrong direction and put him on the right way. The way should remind us of what Jesus said, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through him. That's the way that Paul was going. That's the way that he wanted to lead these people to see. So in a seemingly hopeless situation where 
you'd expect one to give in and, and cower and deny any belief or familiarity with this stuff that's going to get him persecuted. Well, he doesn't. He admits it, willfully, joyfully admits that this is the way that it is. And what's amazing is that he's doing this while on trial. He's doing this with, with limitations and restrictions. He's doing this to a group of people who are his enemies and adversaries, who are against him. God's timing's perfect, though. Against all odds, against all other things, when an opportunity looks like it's no good at all, God uses people like Paul to continue to share the word. Can you think of a time in your lives when you've been limited or restricted to doing things like normal? Can you think of a time when, when not just like your regular life has been restricted, but what you're supposed to do as a Christian can't be the same anymore? Where you could normally tell people and interact with them, and now you can't. Well, gee, it sounds like everything that's going on right now. And that's what we mean by saying God's timing is perfect. We might look at the situation and, and, and conclude that, what can we do? We can give in, we can give up and say, well, we just kind of have to wait before we can continue doing our job as Christians. But that's not what Paul did. And that's not what God wants us to do either. Paul joyfully and willingly admitted he's a Christian, and, and against all odds, he used the one thing that could change these hearts of stone of his accusers and bring them over to the side that restores hope. He used the word. That's our mission, too. When times are tough, when things look like they could never go our way, we go back to the word. So Paul goes back to the word. He admits these things and says that he believes everything that's written in the word, the law, the prophets. And he says, I have the same hope in God as these men. And there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. See what the Apostle Paul builds upon. It's built on this wonderful, firm, solid foundation, this immovable rock that is Jesus and all that he's done. That is the word. But he says there's other people who believe these things. He's not alone. He has the same hope as these men before him. This isn't the only time that God has made his, his perfect timing known or where God has gone against all odds and, and accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. Think about Moses when he had to go up against Pharaoh. It would have been easy for him to give in and, and think that he, he's, he's just a, a Hebrew and here's Pharaoh. But he didn't think that. Think of Jeremiah and how he would preach this message of doom and destruction to a people with deaf ears who didn't want to listen to a word he was saying. And by and large, think about our Savior and all of the opposition that he faced, but nothing stopped him from going through with his mission to die so that we could live. God accomplishes what he wants to accomplish against all odds, no matter what restrictions or limitations are there. So Paul reminds us of that in just a quick little way. He says, he has the same hope in God as these men. That hope is built on our Savior Jesus who rose from the dead. Paul is the one who wrote that great resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. While there's many great things in it, one of the greatest things that stands out is that quote that says, Where, O death, is your sting? Where, O death, is your victory? God was going to come back and he was going to judge the living and the dead. The righteous would rise, but so would the wicked. And that seems like a scary thought at first. Maybe that's why some of these were denying the resurrection. Maybe that's why they didn't want to believe it, because they knew the wickedness in their own hearts. We know the wickedness too. But Paul's not scared of that resurrection. He looks forward to it. He willingly and joyfully admits these things because of what else he wrote in that great resurrection chapter. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, our faith would be futile. Everything we'd be doing here would be worthless. 
If Christ had not been raised from the dead, our sins would still be upon us. But that's not the case. But indeed, Christ has been raised from the dead. And so he has this wonderful joy. He looks forward to the resurrection. He gladly and willfully admits it and shares it against all opposition. It's not something scary to look forward to. It's a joyous occasion to look forward to. When God comes back, he will judge us not according to our deeds, but according to what Jesus has done. Jesus, his blood covers us. When he died on the cross, he took payment for all of your sins. Everything you've done wrong, everything bad, all the world placed on him. That's why there was darkness. That's why Jesus cried out, why have you forsaken me? That's why he died, so that you could have life. And to assure us, he rose from the dead. And that's what Paul's saying, and that's why Paul's on trial. So he's not going to back down from this greatest news the world has ever heard. He's not going to stop sharing this, this most loving act the world has ever seen. No, he's going to willfully and joyfully share it. He'll go on and, and he'll continue to say that they have nothing against him. He was just doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was doing nothing wrong. It was all in accordance. They had all of these opportunities to come to him, to take him away, but they have nothing against him. So the real reason why he's there is because of what he shouted. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial today. In the face of opposition, in the midst of restrictions and limitations, Paul uses God's word in such a wonderful way. What's so wonderful about this lesson is that we have the same hope. Paul says he has the same hope as those before him. We look back on Paul and all those others and say we have the same hope. It'd be easy for us to look at this situation and think we couldn't do anything about it. But if you take a step back, change your perspective of one of doubt to one of hope, and you can see the wonderful things that God is doing. I see our school teachers adapting in the blink of an eye to still teach children. And those of our, of our synod in those schools still teaching them God's word and, and doing that. I see our, our publishing houses and many pastors going out and, and sharing family devotions like they never have before. Content each and every day, whether it's a minute or five, so many people are communicating God's word. I see churches worshiping in ways they never have before. Maybe there's only eight or ten people in worship, but they're doing things in a different way. Reaching audiences they have never reached before. I see people at home going into the word reading their Bibles more often. I see people sharing their faith in, in different ways. Maybe it's just making a happy heart display and you have a cross in the middle. Maybe you're calling your neighbor like you never have before or, or sharing your faith in different ways because times are different. God's timing is perfect. God allowed these restrictions and limitations to come to the Apostle Paul, and, and he used it for such a wonderful opportunity. God's done the same for us, and we have wonderful opportunity to still communicate Christ, to admit willingly and joyfully that we believe in the resurrection of the dead. And against all odds and opposition, that will not stop us from sharing this message. God's timing is always perfect. God uses everything for the good of those who love him. This is another one of those times. I challenge us to be like the Apostle Paul, to be an ambassador of Christ who uses God's word and preaches it in a different way, in a way where it doesn't seem like it would work, but we know God's word always works because God always accomplishes what he wants to accomplish. I challenge us to share our faith in ways we never have before. Different ways. Take new avenues, new opportunities. God's timing's perfect. He allowed Paul to still be a wonderful missionary in prison, in chains, and now here on trial. 
He can allow us to be wonderful missionaries while we face restrictions and limitations too. All because we have the same hope of the men before us. We have the same hope of the believers before us who believe in the resurrection of the dead. That restores our hope. That lifts us up. That wants us, makes us want to go out there and share these wonderful truths. We have the same hope. Let's share it. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which transcends all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together in a confession of faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We will continue to gather our offerings in, in a little bit of a different way. After the service, I'd ask those who are here to put their offerings in here if they haven't already. Also use this time to fill out your connection card too. You can do one per family. For those worshiping at home, we have a digital connection card for you to fill out. Please let us know if uh, you and who else is with you is worshiping with us today. We, we love to, to know that we are reaching more people. There's also plenty of ways for us to um, contribute to our mission here in, uh, from Good Shepherd. Uh, you can see the, the different ways there. You can give with, with simply giving um, by bringing an offering to church, um, by mailing it to church. You can give through the Giving Plus app, or you can also give through, through Thrivent if you're a Thrivent member as well. For now, we continue to sing our Lord's praises and we offer up to him our hymns of praise. Uh, we sing verse 2 of hymn 492. Please stand. For the prayer of the church, we will have a responsive prayer. Um, I'll say the pastor parts, and you guys can say the, the congregational parts. We also have a few special intercessions. Um, first of all, a prayer of thanksgiving for Mark Neuer's parents who are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. That'll be on Thursday, April 30th. Then we also have a, a prayer for Linda Neuer's mom, Doris Fritch, who is having a procedure to shock her heart to hopefully correct the, the AFib she is experiencing. That'll be on Monday, April 27th. So we keep all of those and, and everything, everybody else who will pray for um, in our thoughts and prayers. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, 
sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick. Cheer those who are sad. Calm those who are distressed. And comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessing to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. Dear Lord, we also come before you with a prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you for the many wonderful years of marriage that you have granted to Mark Neuer's parents, to Don and Pat. What a wonderful thing it is that you tell us that your love for us is like a marriage that you come before us and you, you commit yourself to us and you show us a wonderful love. That is what the type of love that you want reflected in a marriage. We thank you for allowing Don and Pat to reflect that love to each other for 60 years. We pray that their celebration on April 30th will be yet another wonderful one to remind them of the love they have for each other as the love they have in Christ. Dear Lord, we also pray that you would be with Linda's mother, Doris Fitch. She's going to be undergoing a procedure, and you know how to take care of her. You know how to guide her and comfort her, and so we pray that you would. Give her peace. Give her patience. Let her know that you are always with her. Let her know that she has a Redeemer who lives, and if he lives and has conquered everything for her already, well, he can be with her and conquer this too. So give her peace and comfort. Help her to know that she has a living Savior and that she can always come to you with whatever worries or cares that she has. And finally, dear Lord, we ask that you hear us as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We sing our sermon hymn, a, a wonderful hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. <laughs> Within the veil, on 
Christ, the solid rock I stand, to the ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant and blood support me in the raging flood, when every earthly power gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. The solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound to me, I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Please stand as we close with prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. You may be seated, and we sing our closing hymn, Abide, O Dearest Jesus. Good morning once again. Good morning once again. Glad to have you guys join us today in person and for those who joined us online. We've been given permission to show our Wells connection uh, via live stream too. And so we'll take a minute, we'll watch that, and then I'll, I'll make a few announcements.
So just a, a few announcements for everyone. Um, we hope you're able to continue joining us via live stream if you're not here in person. We'll continue to invite people, a family or two at a time, trying to get to that number of 10 while we can. So if you do get an invite, uh, please do consider joining us because we never know when we'll come back around for the second round. And we don't know how, how long these restrictions will be in place. Also, I'm looking forward to having Bible class with you via Zoom. We're going to use Zoom because that platform allows for certain teaching capabilities that other platforms might not have. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom, that's totally okay. I was and kind of still am. I'm learning it. Uh, we will have a practice session today in uh, about 30 minutes at 10 30 um, we're going to start a, a zoom meeting you should have gotten an email from us in the mailchimp um, if you didn't sign up for mailchimp and you will get those emails you'll have to join the meeting and this will just be an opportunity to to learn how to join and know what it's about and and kind of enjoy some virtual fellowship with one another when you join you might have to click um, a few buttons um, after they join the meeting, you might have to set up the audio and the visual, um, those types of things. But hopefully this opportunity works out those kinks. Other than that, um, pray that you guys have a wonderful week and we uh, enjoy worshiping with you and pray that you have restored your hope and know you have the, the same hope that Paul and so many others have had in Jesus. God bless you.